Please, can you remind me if you'll, if you'll be so kind? Staring out into space, asking God to hear my case. Trying to think of all things past. How long will my memory last? The purple angel. with Alzheimer's Speaks Radio, and we are going to have a wonderful show for you today. But before I introduce our guest, I always like to give new listeners a little, little bit of knowledge about who we are and what we do and why the heck we're here. Um, bottom line, Alzheimer's Speaks is about shifting our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort all around the world. And we do that by raising everyone's voice at all levels. And we agree to disagree at times in a friendly, um, heartfelt manner because everybody who is on the show is filled with passion about shifting our culture in some fashion or another. So I hope you'll subscribe not only to our radio show, but our blog, our YouTube channel, our website, and so forth. You can um, access all by going to alzheimerspeaks.com. And there you will find resources, tips, and tools. Um, uh, all throughout the website, from poetry to information on speaking and training to initiatives and projects like the Dementia Quick Tips, like Dementia Chats, Memory Cafes, Becoming Dementia Friendly, and so much more. Now, I started this company because my own mother lived with dementia for 30 years, and I just felt this overwhelming need to try to connect people because our family was not connected and didn't have any knowledge of resources, tools, and or projects um, that were out there. And so since uh, 2009, um, we have been working really hard to change that and to connect people. So maybe you listening might be our next guest. And if you've got a story to tell or a concept or product or tool you want to get out, um, please reach out. Just go to alzheimerspeaks.com. There's a big gold button at the top that says contact, and you can pick your choice of how you want to reach out to me. We also help companies design their brand footprint by expanding it through all of the content that we drive out. And if that's an interest, again, um, please reach out to me. Now I'm going to give a couple of shout outs. The first is to the Memory Cafe directory. I love this. It is just a wonderful, wonderful tool where you can not only find a memory cafe in your area, but maybe you have one, but you don't know how to advertise it. Dave will get you up and running for free. Just go to memorycafedirectory.com. The other organization is Stallcatchers, and I think I find this fascinating. We can actually go to stallcatchers.com, play a game and actually be analyzing real Alzheimer's data and pushing the needle forward. And so check them out. Again, that's stallcatchers.com. Uh, and let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Um, I've got a couple of um, programs coming up, and I'm just going to highlight uh, just a couple that are public. One is January 30th, and that is going to be Apple Pines in Vadness Heights, Minnesota. That'll be January 30th, uh, starting at 7.30 a.m. and going till 9.30 and we will be providing CEUs. And then I will also be doing a, a webinar for the Greenhouse Project on the 30th, and we'll be pushing information out on that. And on February 19th, another webinar for Educate um, for their 2020 virtual road trip. So those are just some educational programs you might be interested in. Lastly, I just want to thank all of our listeners. You guys have been so great. You follow us, you like us, you share, you push our information out. And that has made a difference, not just for us here at Alzheimer Speaks, but for all the people in your sphere who are in need of resources, tools, and products to give them hope and guidance of how, how it is possible to still have a good life with dementia. So with no further ado, let me introduce our guest today. Well, I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. I have had the privilege of knowing 
Loretta Woodward Benny for um, several years now, but I just got to meet her in person <laughs> this last year. And she has so much energy and is so much fun. And she is not just an exceptional care partner to her mother, but she is just an incredible human being. And she was honored by John Hopkins as the 2019 Trailblazer. And that is so well deserved and, and just is so fantastic. And she was also honored the um, Women of Valor Award in 2017. So this is one incredible woman that we're going to be talking with today that is just a mover and a shaker and full of positive energy and insights that you are going to be really glad that you are listening today. And of course, she's written three books because she's just like the little energizer bunny and she just <laughs> goes and goes and um, keeps producing great content. Um, she is a exceptional speaker on dementia and caregiving. And so if you're looking for somebody, check, check Loretta out because she is Fabulous. So welcome, Loretta. I am so honored that you're here with us on Alzheimer's Speaks Radio today. So Loretta, when we start out, I always like to ask every one of our guests how they've been touched by dementia. So do you mind sharing some of your story about how you've been personally touched by dementia? Well, my mom, Doris, is uh, such an amazing person. She was just an awesome mom. And so when you first start to see those um, you know, signs of dementia, you know, you forgot your checkbook when you go to this grocery store or something like that. And you're thinking, wow, it can't be that. But of course it is. And so for us, that happened in 2006 when, you know, got her to the neurologist and, you know, you just hear those horrible words, you know, you're in the beginning stages of dementia. You kind of go, what? So I just froze. I had no idea what to do, who to call, what to do. It was like, ah, oh, it was just crazy time but um, my mother was big always on reading and gathering information and I that switched right to that you know do what she taught you and learn everything you can possibly learn about this thing and it's horrific yes but there are things that we can do so I just tried to I went to <laughs> I know they got tired of seeing me I think I went to every Alzheimer's you know association gathering symposium, seminar, all those things. I went one day, all day, a few hours, and I just tried to learn. And then people started asking me questions. And so um, I felt I was doing the best I could for my mom. You know, I switched doctors at one point. I was going to be her advocate and, and speak for her when she could not. And, you know, we've been inseparable, you know, since the start of that. So you learn a lot over the, you know, the last almost 14 years now. So I've tried to catalog everything and log things and so that I don't forget because so many things happen, behavioral changes, all that. So I always wanted to make sure that um, I had the best of everything for her, you know, information, you know, supplies, you know, you know assistance, whatever we could get, I tried to, to do for her. So that's kind of our story. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. It's just helpful, I think, for the audience to have a little bit of a background. Um, you know, you've been on the show before. It was uh, several years ago. What What yeah. have you been up to since then? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I felt like you know, twenty sixteen when I was on the show. Man, it, it seemed like such a long time ago. So not only did I meet you this past year, as you mentioned, that was a highlight. You know, a huge highlight for me. But since uh, 2016, when I first uh, was on the show, my husband had just died a few months before. So I was, you know, absolutely still in shock about his death. He did so much for my mother. They were inseparable. He would take her to doctor's appointments and then they would go have lunch and they just had a great time together. It was so much more than just a mother-in-law, son-in-law relationship. And so um, I was still so shocked by the whole thing you know, when he died, and I was thinking, wow, what happens with my mom? So I was still, you know, in the midst of all that. And since that time, you know, I've learned to get myself around, you know, he drove me to all my presentations and all that. So I, you know, mail books, and I do, you know, all those kinds of things. So uh, since I was last on the show, I think I've done uh, around 190 or so presentations <laughs> around the country. And that has just been amazing. And I, I don't think I always remember every 
little town I've been in. What I do remember are the people and their stories. So we might have differences of, you know, cultural background, religion, politics, whatever, but that disease binds people. So people are so open to share their stories when somebody comes to their town and I try to stay and, and it's not even about, you know, selling books or signing books. It really is about listening to their stories, looking in their eyes and, you know, feeling their pain and, you know, confusion and all that. And so I just love meeting the people more than anything else. So I have, you know, talked to people on the phone, you know, since then. And I've become much more, I've always been comfortable with people, but I've been become much more comfortable, you know, sharing all this, you know, the stories and, and um, you know, even the difficult ones to tell because that makes other people you know, open up as well. So uh, that's one, you know, thing, just meeting the people. And I think one of the other big things for me is I don't care where you are in the process of this disease with your you know, loved one, you're always worried about finances, always. When I met you and I was on the show the first time, I was still in the throes of um, paying uh, a lot toward my mother's care. And so you always have that fear, well, wow, you know, you're know, you gonna have to work for a long time to continue to save. So one of the most amazing things that happened since I was on the show last was, um, after being on the what they call the Maryland waiver program list, um, after being on that list for more than eight years, my mother's name finally came up, which you know gives you a sort of a subsidy from the state. In my mother's case, it means they accept her retirement check from the federal government as full pay for her care. And it was such a relief. I can't even really describe it because you know your greatest fear, no matter where you are, where you live, what your financial status is, you're always afraid of running out of money because this disease can just wipe it out, you know, pretty quickly. So um, I had to move my mom from one group home to another. And I was, you know, of course, you're always worried about that. They say never move them after they get in the routine. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> but it was the I thought the first place I had my mom in was fabulous. It was called Mamie's Loving Care. And now she's in Life Springs Elder Care, which participates in the waiver program. And you're always so worried about these decisions that you have to make. But wow, I didn't think anything could top the first one. But uh, Life Springs Elder Care is fabulous. And it's um, they have an activities director. They're always doing stuff. It's almost like you have to make an appointment to see your mama. And so <laughs> that, that part is hysterical. But they engage them wherever they are in this process. And it's so close to my house. I'm there all the time. It's like I live there. And so, so many um, devastating things emotionally have happened. You know, she didn't know me the first time I was on the show, but now, you know, uh, at least she knew my name, at least for a while she didn't know our relationship. Now she doesn't know anything. She can't tell you what the name is or what our relationship is, but she still has that smile. So when I go in, she says, hi. <laughs> so she knows she knows me. She just doesn't know where from. So, you know, a lot of highs and then the lows, but the highs for me, you know, kind of outweigh everything else. And then once the financial burden went away, then that leaves you to focus just on the joy of being with her and spending time and you're not so worried about where the next dollar is going to come from and that kind of thing. So those are the, the biggest things, you know, more speeches around the country, meeting the people and providing help, and then finally becoming, you know, financially set, if you will, in terms of my mother's care. So those are the biggest things that have happened since I uh, was on your show last. And those are huge things. And I love how you, you uh, well, A, you have just this contagious laugh and giggle and just aura about you. You just, you just bring joy into the room and make people feel like I can do this. You know, right. Loretta can do right. I can do this. And, you know, and it's funny, you, you talk about the tough times and the finances and the burden and, you know, we have those things hanging over us all of life, you know, but it, you know, it's, it's just different when there's a chronic illness and when you yes. have responsibility for another, um, and, and then the freedom when all of a sudden that's shifted again, as scary as yes. it is, um, it opens up another light and, you know, even though things have progressed, you, um, like myself and many others have been able to find joy. I think it's a, yes. to me, it's a, it's a higher level of unconditional love and yes. that, that we're sensing. And I still haven't been able to 
figure out how to put it into words, but it's just, <laughs> it's a melt your heart. Yes. That, that just doesn't go away. Absolutely. So you talked about the, you know, the financial challenges and things like that. I would imagine there were some other challenges that you had during this journey as well, if you wouldn't mind sharing those as well. Sure. I think the, the, the craziest thing and the most difficult thing a lot of times is just watching your loved one disappear before your eyes, so to speak. So that whole thing of your, the person you spent most of your life with, um, you know, no longer recognizes you. And that's one of the hardest things. And people say, Oh, you know, you'll get used to it. Uh, maybe, but we have to recognize as a big brief period, when that occurs, the first time they don't recognize you, which was my 55th birthday, by the way, the first time my mother didn't remember me. And uh, you just, it's a horrible thing. And then the changes in personality, you know, that's when you learn all of the patience and everything you need. And a lot of the people I meet in these um, presentations around the country is that is the question I'm asked most. How do you build the patience to not yell or scream or fuss you know, with your loved ones. And I always say, you have to remember, I know it's hard, but you have to remember it is the disease. It is not the person. So I think that is really the challenge, you know, is um, still remaining present with that individual in spite of the fact that they don't know who you are. They're still in there somewhere. And, and I'm willing to wait long enough. She comes back every now and then. And I'm willing to wait for that because the limited amount of time when you see that person that you used to know is worth all of the rest of it. And I, I think that's the greatest you know, challenge, I believe. So I think I think part of it too, you know, with the the disappearance and the loss is that we, we focus so much on them changing. But I know for myself I never acknowledged that I was changing too. Yes. We and, do. And, and that we were all evolving and none of us are who we once were. But what I realized was that I was holding on for dear life to this woman I didn't want to lose. And yes. And yet I changed, you know, my dad had passed. I mean, er everything, everything about our family had changed and, yes. and that I wasn't willing to let her change. And it made me realize how unfair that was. And, and not that she would have picked those choices and said, Hey, sign me up. You know, I'm, this is, this is how I want to go out. You know, I mean, no one's, yeah. no one's, you know, standing in line for that, but um, really, I, I, and it sounds like you found this too, that the, the core being is still there. The soul is yes. still there yes. and, and it can't shine as bright or as often, but, um, and it made me pay attention more. It made me be present more. Yes which I you think is where that, where that patience comes from. And again, sometimes I'm, I'm still not so good with that. You know, I think I'll have to work on patience, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. but it has helped me understand that I don't control everything and that I had to let some of those things go. And that was mm -hmm. a, that was kind of like a big release of a burden too, to think, okay, I don't need, plans a through z anymore i can i can be spontaneous mm -hmm. i can i can trust um in myself and in in my god or higher power whatever you want to say that you know i'm going to have i'm going to have to deal with whatever happens with my wow. energy level my finances my time frame my knowledge and even if i make all those plans i'm still going to have to adjust to that anyways and That's so that correct. and so that was a really big um, challenge, but then again, I, I'm always kind of looking for the gift at the end, and I think that's one of the beautiful things when I listen to you speak. You know, you always you always come out at the bright side, and wow. um, not that you haven't walked on the dark side. I think we all have <laughs> at yeah. times with this, but there but there are some gifts. What's the most important um, advice you would give to care partners? Uh, I would say that you know just be prepared for you know every day being different and you know we think you know you said the word control you know you think you know well i'm going to plan for this i'm going to write this down i'm going to do that and then some weird thing happens that you never saw coming so you know we always have to be prepared for the unexpected and you know the greatest piece of advice is because you know all these unexpected things wear you down in a hurry and so 
the greatest piece of advice I, I always recommend is you have to have a support system. And I hear people say, I'm an only child. Or I don't. Find some friends because you cannot do this alone. And all you have to do is you know, ask people. So what happened for me when uh, my husband Tim died was my church put together you know, this phenomenal support group you know, for me, you know, who has their own support group. But I did. You know, some wonderful folks who you know, love me and you know, help me with a lot of the things that my husband used to do for my mom. And, and so you have to have that. They let me cry. They laugh with me. We did group hugs you cannot get through this disease alone. And everybody thinks, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. That's when, you know, we have all kinds of health problems and we might even pass away before the loved one that we're taking care of. And so um, I don't want to scare people in my presentations, but if we don't take care of ourselves, we certainly can't take care of ourselves. So the greatest advice is remember yourself, take care of yourself, take some deep breaths, and then no, don't, hopefully we can avoid being, um, so overwhelmed by some of the day-to-day -day things because they can be very painful, you know, as we're going through them. So that's the greatest advice, you know, just be ready, expect the unexpected kind of thing. And just remember every single day is different. So when I have a really bad day, you know, if mom or mom's really struggling with something, I always say tomorrow will be better. And it usually is. Yeah, we, all, we always have another moment, yeah, to, to reframe <laughs> yes. things or do things differently. I was a big one where I would beat myself up really bad, you know, if I, oh. if I didn't, if I didn't, if I didn't stand up to the level of expectation I had mm -hmm. for myself, for her, and I, I just would feel horrible. And I, right. I had to learn to let that go, that I did the best in the moment. It wasn't intentional Absolutely. if I snapped and, um, and that we always have another moment to do better. And we can learn from those, those things that we didn't get so right. Sure. Um, and uh, the other thing I guess I would add is with, you know, kind of being spontaneous and being ready is um, one of the things that I learned from it, and I, I think you have too, is that some of those detours can be really beautiful, you know, yes. ways that you wouldn't have explored otherwise. And, and so very you know, true. that can be really cool. What about your new edition of Being Mom's Mom? Why don't you yes. tell us about that? Yeah, and you know, it's, it seems like, you know, I just wrote the thing, but it came out in the first edition came out in 2013 in, in you know, uh, in February. So many years ago now. And um, so many things have happened between um, uh, then and now that I felt, you know, it needed, you know, an update. So, you know, in some of my presentations, I had added the things about some of the apps that have helped me along the way and, and some of the changes that, that mom had gone through and, and some of the strategies that I tried to use, you know, with that. And so um, I thought it was time to, you know, add those things. You know, the, the book is really based on, you know, forgiveness and patience and, you know, having the you know, strategies and, and all those kinds of things, you know, being prepared. So I, I added a lot about the process of, you know, the preparation and the things that I'd learned. And one of them, of course, was to, um, and I have no idea why I did this, but my mom was diagnosed in, in 2006. I did not know I should, you know, put my name on everybody's list for services and things that, you know, we were actually entitled to. And you don't know that at the beginning. And for whatever reason, I waited until 2009. Well, of course, by the time I put her name on the list, there's 20,000 people, 23,000 people on the list in front of us. And, and then you just wait. So I tell people, put your name on every list <laughs> that even if you don't need it now. Cause you know, I said, well, I don't want to put my name on the list for the, the pens, you know, the, the hygiene products because you know, she doesn't need them right now. By the time your name comes up, you will need them. And so um, those kinds of things. So I added all that in the book, you know, to all the things I learned about preparation, you know, getting all those health documents, the living will, all those things in place, the DNRs, whatever your loved one wants. You have to make sure you have that. So I want to make sure I, I went into, um, detail with that. So I added all of the things that had changed with mom and how we dealt with that. And I thought that would really be helpful um, for folks. So, and, and so we came out uh, a few weeks ago in, uh, in January. So well, that's, happy about that. That's exciting. <laughs> it's funny when you were talking about the list, we just had a, 
a long conversation at our memory cafe about that because somebody asked a question and then everyone who's been through the process is like, do it, do yes. it, get on the list, get on the list. Does it make get any difference? Money? Does it make any difference? I'm telling you, I don't care what the list is, you know, put your name on it because, and, and sometimes these lists, you know, and you know, you get on one list and then all these other services came about that you didn't even know you needed like, Hey, you know, so yeah, because I was paying, you know, for the day-to-day the -day care. And then I was also paying for the, you know, the hygiene products and other things. And then once you got, you know, on the list, everything was included. So, okay, here we go. Who knew that? And so, it, and people, you know, sometimes, well, you know, I don't want to take away from other people. Well, um, you know, that's what services are there for. For people to you know to take advantage of them and of the services and take some of the burden off themselves so i try to get people out of that guilt thing you know about the lists because they exist for a reason that's why there's a department of aging yeah well and sometimes it's, it might be for adult day or it might be for sure. uh, for housing community and you can always say yes. no um, but yeah. it's, it's better to have the opportunity to say yes you know to keep your options <laughs> exactly. open and broad because you know, you're gonna learn things, and if you don't think it's appropriate at the time, you you still can say no. You Absolutely. Can, and 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 that to me is an empowering thing too. It is just um, because you're gaining knowledge as you're doing it, and even if you don't need it, somebody else might need it. Somebody does. Yep. That is so true, and I, I've learned so much from this process. And people are, you know, furiously taking notes. You know, as I talk about, you know, the various lists to to look for and see. I always tell people make a list of the things you think you need, and then you know find the appropriate office in your state or county that can provide that service. So that's well, so and helpful. It, and it's funny now with Google. I mean, like back I think when my mom started. You know, that was thirty five years ago. Mm -hmm. Google. You know, the internet was was right. out there, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but now you right. just, like type it in and go, oh, yes. there is something out there, or, or maybe that's something that needs to be created, or maybe it's called a different thing. But yes. um, you know, you, you might connect with people who, you know, have similar thoughts or who have gone through that process. I mean, you just don't know where the path is going to lead with that's those correct. types of things. But it is is very uplifting. Now I have to have you talk about your Lego projects and your passion <laughs> for it because. I gotta tell you, when you said Legos, I'm like, what? 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 I mean, that's just gonna be. And then, and then I've been seeing these posts on your, on your site, and I'm like, oh my gosh! I, I you know, the one where you're building the cathedral, and it's just like, I mean, it, and then you've got your small groups, and then what you do with your mom, and even in the car, and I'm like, oh, people yeah. have got to hear about this because it's. Fantastic, sure. and the Lego company should be endorsing you for <laughs> yeah. all you're doing. So, um, so please tell us. Yes, indeed. So, it, you know, pretty selfish reason for all this. So, um, one of the greatest bonds I had with my mom um, as a kid was, um, you know, spending lots of time building these Lego projects. And, you know, I had no idea as a child how, you no know, children, you know, we don't realize this as children that how expensive Legos really were. And my mom as a single mom, she spent all this money, you know, buying these you know, little bricks, but you know, she wanted me to use my imagination. So I didn't have all the sets like they have now. We just had the plain bricks and we would build all day. And I just loved it. We laughed and she took pictures of everything. And, and I held on to that. So, you know, how kids get older and they give away a lot of that stuff. I never gave the Legos away. So I started using them in my work environment. I, I, um, I'm a security person, so I was using doing tabletop exercises for emergency plans and things like that. So I always had them in the car. And as probably 2007, 2008, not long after she was diagnosed, mom started to be really fidgety in the car. So I threw just a whole slew of variety of Lego bricks in this you know, Ziploc bag and kept it in the car. And one of the little bases that you build everything on. And that's kind of how our, you know, in the reuniting with Lego bricks came about. And I started to build all these little Lego fidget toys for her. And, you know, here's one and it has doors and windows. She can still um, open doors and little windows. And I have little Lego people inside it. And 
what I love about this is that it still allows her there are a lot of things she can't do we all get that in this disease but she likes the bright colors and so i, I have some pieces with faces and you know she likes spinning it around so i have a whole variety a bag really of these fidget toys that i made for her that and you can see the light come on um in her eyes and people think i make that up so when we <laughs> were uh, interviewed by um the Washington Post, the photographer came to take photos and, you know, mom hadn't really been recognizing, you know, anybody's in the room with us until, you know, you get the Legos out and then she comes alive, like, hello, <laughs> like they just walked in, they've been here for two hours, you know, and they, they, you know, the photographer was like, wow, I thought you made that up. She just comes back to life and she starts to build and I bought her these doors and windows and she says, I'm building a house so I can go home. And that's what every dementia patient wants to do they want to go home so if i can give my mom some security in that um i have all kinds of little things she can you know pull on it uses you know it still has her dexterity in her fingers and she can pull and push and all that so i have all kinds of different varieties and probably 10 different ones and i sold them on etsy for a while and i got kind of too busy to, to keep up with that but um you know some of the friends uh, in church groups and some of the other memory care facilities that i go to i have you know built a variety of things but for me the fact that she doesn't know my name or our relationship she knows those legos and so i have kept with that um you know part of our life and i've been able to keep that alive the one thing i could still hold on to and so in 2014 i became um certified in something called lego serious play and it helps teams and groups communicate more effectively uh, and you know, brings people together on their vision and mission and those kind of things. So I, I do that in a lot of organizations as well. And, and some of the adult day and memory care uh, places that I go, I've done those as well. So really for me, this little teeny brick that's primarily, you know, a kid's toy, although there are a lot of uh, adult Lego fans, they call a uh, adult fans of Lego and lots of them out there. But primarily something that was built for kids really can still keep a lot of people together and focused and having fun in spite of a lot of challenges. So when I'm in the car with my mom and she's fidgety and all that, and you, you whip out something that's an instant solution, that's gold you know, right there. And so she smiles and then she'll say, I did that. And that's like the best thing ever. <laughs> and, um, you know, because there's so many things, as I say, that, you know, you, she can no longer do it, but I just, I choose to look at the other end. So I, I still focus on all the things she can still do. And that includes, you know, having some fun, some calm, you know, some continuity amongst, you know, this little thing called Lego. And I never knew when we were having all those hours back then playing and building and enjoying each other, who knew that that would be the thing that would continue to connect us 40 years later. So. That's amazing. I, I remember with my mom, it would be coloring, and she yes, you know, and and she would color with my my daughter, who at the time was you know three five years old, and I wouldn't know who was prouder of their coloring, you know, pages they yes. would fold them up, and um, and and that excitement, ooh. that innocence, that that ability to just um, be so. So present in that moment and, and feel valued and feel purposeful. I mean, it's, it's contagious. It's a beautiful thing to watch. It's a beautiful thing to be able to, um, to do for another person, to allow them those moments because it yeah. doesn't just feel them. It feels everybody around them. And it really is. And I have so many pictures of her, you know, I take pictures of everything because obviously I use them because I want other families to be inspired by all the things that they can still do. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> when AARP did a feature on us for their caregiver stories on their website, they called me the entertainment director because I'm always going to find stuff. So I, I love that title. Call me whatever you want. It's, it's cool. But the, the thing about the Legos is, you know, she is so proud of it. You know, the things that she has built and as she's doing it, I take pictures to, um, you know, show other, you know, families, you know, it might not be Legos in your family, but there's something, you know, woodworking, sewing, knitting, something that they may still be able to call upon those memories and, and still enjoy, maybe not in the same way that they did. And I, you know, it's funny because I, I used to think my mom was just doing the Legos just for me, you know, with me and, you know, for me, but, but 
who knew she was having that much fun, I guess, and, or just, or why it is one of the things that has stuck in her memory. And at this point, I don't care why. Uh, I just love that smile that, you know, she's having a good time. She's not anxiety filled. Um, doesn't matter what it looks like and, or anything. You know, nobody cares. It's just that she's occupied. She's happy. She's smiling. And, you know, as a caregiver, that's all you want. Yeah, or, or hopefully all all that you, you know, I think a lot of times people don't even know that they can attain that. Yes. You know? But it's it's that calmness, it's that peacefulness that they have. And then when there's a level of joy on top of that, you know, right. when when you see them in that state, anyways, this is how I, how it was for me. When I would see my mom in that state, it would put me in that state. And I would be so Absolutely. grateful and so happy that I, I, you know, I let go of all the other grunge sure. that, was, that I was thinking about because it was just like, sure. oh, this is so, it was just, thank you, God. It, that's as simple as it is. Yes, exactly. And that gratefulness, see, that's, that's so true because there are so many um, entries in my grateful journal that I have on my phone and you can attach videos and, um, you know, still photos to it. And so many of them are of her, you know, doing the Legos. And so, um, you know, that's all I really need. But I do, you know, I try my best to keep her busy and they have an activity director, you know, there at the um, the group home where she is. And some of the other, uh, I, I left enough uh, over there that, you know, everybody else can join in as well if they like to. So, you know, when you find something that works like that, you certainly want to, you know, spread it around and, you know, all of that. The adult day program that I'm going to next Monday, when I went with them this past August, we did a huge Lego exercise and it was to say it was a success would be you know an understatement we had the little kids building with all the different colors and then we had the adults building with all the different colors but then we went to do the intergenerational projects we had them use just the white bricks lego has a um product called lego architecture and all the bricks are white and so when the relatives came you know the parents or the children of the folks with dementia when they came in they could just look at the huge table that we had built the entire day of you know lego pieces you know um, and they could see you know all the white pieces on the table were what the you know older folks did with the young kids and so it was amazing all the People were taking pictures of this huge table we had done. And you walk away from that so accomplished. And a guy who doesn't participate in many of the activities at all, you know, they can't get it. Right before we did the Lego thing, they were doing a game or something. He sat in the corner, didn't want to do it. But when we got the Legos out, he jumped up. He built this thing. When his daughter came, she said, you did that? Yes. He, he waited for her at the door with the thing. It was phenomenal. It was, it was I almost cried. It was the coolest thing. But to watch the families come in and says, y'all did it. Because when, the, when they came in to drop the, them off, they, the table was empty, you know, in the middle of the room where everybody has to walk by. And then by the time the day was over at four o'clock or whatever it was, the table was filled with these amazing, you know, things that people had created with their imagination. And uh, that's probably one of my best days ever with the Lego bricks. But watching the young folks you know, work together with the seniors was, um, it's just an amazing thing. And so it was the smartest thing I ever could have done was focusing on the white pieces so they could see all the things that they did together, you know, as a team. Oh, that's neat. And I, I love the intergenerational piece. I love the, I love just the simplicity of it. I think sometimes yes. people think dementia has to be so complicated. It has to be so hard. Yeah, right. And it's the simpler, the better for all of us, you know, and Absolutely. The, that we can find, you know, because with, with Legos, I mean, it's kind of a sensory thing. And then you get to physically see, you know, what you're doing. And then you get to hear from other people, the accolades. And then when you're merging it with something else and it becomes even bigger, you know, those are things that, that I don't think go away with any person. You know, they're just kind of core values that we sometimes overlook and yes. that are still there. And so brilliant, brilliant. Um, what, what are some of the greatest achievements that you feel, you know, you've made as a, as a care partner so far in your journey? Oh, you know, you get so many uh, accolades and just the emails and 
you know, the notes I get from people. And, you know, you love those things when you're having a bad day. You want to go and, and look at them. And these are just ordinary people who have taken the time to write you and say, oh, you saved me or you uplifted me or whatever you did. And, and so when I do those presentations, I always talk about having a joy folder where you keep all those things that you can look at on the bad days. So I, I love the fact that I have that and that people have taken the time to do that. And then there's been a couple of, you know, public acknowledgements too, as an Episcopal church um, here in the, in the DC area that uh, gave me a Woman of Valor Award in 2017, and that was uh, pretty phenomenal. And, um, you know, when people recognize you for that, that's um, you know, humbling in a way, because you, you want to do well in the sense that, uh, can I help a family be more confident in all the things that lay in front of them, you know, give them some hope and, you know, some information and all those things. And so you want to do that. And one of the things I always said I wanted to do was just to guide other people. And so this past December, uh, John, Johns Hopkins Medicine in Baltimore named me the 2019 Trailblazer of the Year. And oh my, that was um, it was really amazing. I was very surprised. I found out about it a few months before. And I was thinking, wow, what? But I didn't realize at the time how big a deal it was. And, you know, I want to invite people and all that kind of stuff. Like, wow, you know, my daughter was able to come and, you know, she recorded my little speech. And it was amazing. And I was so proud because, you know, when you think of what my goal was, was, you know, to, you know, provide information for others and help guide them through this pretty horrific disease, especially in the beginning. I mean, you don't think there's any way out of this or how you're going to survive and all that. And to say that, you know, people say that I brought them hope. And so in their trailblazer of the year, you know, acknowledgement, that's it in the background there. It says that, you know, I have been dedicated um, to the ad advocacy of Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers. And that's all you want. You want to be supportive and, and you want to help other people advocate. You know, you don't have to have a bad doctor that's, you know, making you feel worse than the disease itself. So, you know, when you advocate for this person, you are their voice. And so, you know, I didn't like my mom's original neurologist at all. And so, you know, we were able to switch neurologists to that. So I try to empower people to, you're not stuck with this, you know, be that voice. You don't let your person, you know, be treated badly. I want people, I don't care what stage she's in, I want people to treat my mother with di the dignity that she deserves. And, you know, we have to fight for that. So any caregiver that I can empower to do that, um, I feel I've accomplished it. And so I can't even put into words how much I appreciated that award from Johns Hopkins. It was amazing and probably one of the most beautiful things I'd seen. Like, wow, that's for me. And but it will always be a reminder that I am doing the right thing. And this is my calling. There is no question about it. I love my job. I do. You know, I love all the presentations that, you know, I get to give and I work and the people I work with love that. And I love all the Lego stuff, but being out there in the midst of um, people, letting them cry and feel whatever they feel and, you know, smile and get hold. We, there's a couple of seminars that I do where we dance around and you could tell some of these kids that haven't danced in years and they feel so free to, you know, kind of do that. So if that's, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and I know that of all the things that, you know, God has called me to do, this absolutely is my calling. And I'm, I'm pretty, um, you know, proud to have that job, if that's what you want to call it. But I love what I do. And I love just the look of relief sort of melting from the person standing in front of me. Like, you gave me a solution and I really thank you. So that's some of the achievement, you know, I think. Yeah, well, and I know I um, I surely felt that when I came and, and listened to you speak, you know, and, uh, you know, coming from another speaker who, you know, hears a lot of people. I mean, I, uh, Loretta, you're fantastic. And you thank you so much. You make people feel so comfortable and you use humor and you walk in the audience and you're just you're down there with everybody. And you are one of the most um, open, kind um and, and, and vulnerable. I mean, you just, you just say what happens and, you know, but you come up yeah. with solutions on how to deal with it. You just don't, you know, go, yeah. Oh, what was me? This is, you know, this right. is going to happen, but you come up with solutions to make it better and you share those. And, and I think you yeah. empower your audiences to, 
be able to walk out and go, I've got knowledge too, and I can share, right. it, you know, because I just learned tonight and, <coughs> and, uh, and things. So yeah, fabulous. That's fabulous. Really that is, it, you know, when, when my mom escaped from her, you know, group home and, and again, I could have been mad. I could have done all these things, but like you said, I found a solution. I put the little tracker in her shoe <laughs> and you can run again, but I'm gonna find you this time. So, so, you know, you have to, you know, get over the hurt or anger or whatever it is or when things happen, but then you find that solution so you're better prepared for the next event. So I, I try to impart that uh, to other folks as well. So, Do you mind, one of, one of my favorite stories you shared was the suitcase by the door that you shared. It, can, do you <laughs> mind sharing that with our audience? Because I thought, what a, what a brilliant idea. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that the dementia folks, um, always want to do is go home and so I have um a lot of things that were in I guess this old trunk that my mom had you know back in the day so I have a one of her old suitcases I don't know why I never threw this thing away but it looks old and it's, it's not totally falling apart but I put stuff in it you know old stuff from back in the day some jewelry and all kinds of things and you know as the sundowners comes to visit us <laughs> in the evening that's when she I want to go home you know, she paces a lot anyway at this stage. I said she's going toward the later stages now. Um, so I put the, started putting the suitcases, you know, by suitcase by the door because she always wants to, you know, go home. And so we let her pick up the suitcase to walk around with it. She's not going anywhere, but she feels, you know, like she's empowered and she can go and she has all her stuff. And that calms her down pretty much instantly. But it is a cool <laughs> It is a cool story, but, and, you know, we don't want her to open the door and go out, but at least she, she has that um, certainty that this is mine, it's my stuff, and I'm ready to go, and I, and I can go home kind of anytime I want, and that's, that's solved a lot of her problems. She still tries the door every now and then, but maybe it's because, you know, she knows the little, her belongings are right there that she doesn't try it. I'm not sure why, but, but it, it has been really helpful, especially, you know, middle stage where they, they're going to go no matter what you say then let them, here's your stuff. You know, we can go sometimes, you know, we will walk out if it's nice, you know, you can walk outside with the little suitcase, we'll get her in the car or whatever. But, you know, all of these strategies that you could come up with for folks that, you know, want to run off or run away. Because think about when you were a kid, how many times did kids say, I'm going to run away and <laughs> you pack all your stuff. You're just doing the same thing in reverse, you know, here. But if that makes her comfortable, you know, I'm glad I didn't throw it away. That's what I'd say. But it's a, it's a cool thing. Great. Well, in wrapping up, why don't you share with our audience, um, you know, what you speak and train on and what types of audiences sure. you talk to? Sure. So um, I have three presentations that are really popular. The Being My Mom's Mom, which are kind of the things we uh, just talked about, the patience, forgiveness, preparation, you know, humor, all of those things uh, in that presentation. And then I do um, lifting the spirit of the caregiver or joys of caregiving it has a couple of different names. And that really does, as you pointed out, we are grieving for this person as they go through this process and it's okay to embrace that. But we also have to have hope as well. So that it focuses on that and still more humor and those kinds of things. So people love that when we dance around in that when we do a couple other activities um, in that to try to you know, get us some mindfulness uh, about our caregiving. And then uh, another really popular one is the uh, amazing tools to lighten the caregiver load. And the purpose of that is to help people with apps, with things that help them get out of, in and out of bed easier, the thing that you can use to shampoo, you know, their head while they're laying down and things like that. So, you know, hygiene, you can still keep up with those kinds of things. And so it has a variety of things, um, activities that they can do at every stage so that's a, a really good one because you know, as you pointed out the internet's here but not everybody has time to research all these things to a keep you busy keep you safe and so we have guards for this and locking that up so people are feverishly taking notes and taking pictures of the screen but i love that i can do some of that research for them so that's that and then new for uh 2020 i'm going to be doing um engaging activities for every Alzheimer's stage. So I'm really excited about that one. I've been doing a lot of research, spent a lot of money to getting stuff for, for my mom to have some fun, but um, I want to take those uh, on the journey with me to show people, you know, have at the front kind of show and tell. Uh, you, you, you saw my dog, I think, that my mother's a little pet, <laughs> the robotic dog that we have. Everybody loves that. 
and uh, I'm an affiliate in that program now. So uh, anybody that buys one of those, um, uh, that's always a good thing. And so it's a um, an honor to do that kind of research that you think is going to help somebody. So whether they're right at the beginning stage or they're you know in the late stage, you can still do activities with them. You might just have to change the way you do them, or you know the um, materials that you you know are using with them but they can still do activities you know all you know pretty much up to the end of the disease and so um that's what i want to encourage people to do because people say i go to a nursing home and they just sitting in the chair not doing anything okay well bring something for them to do so <laughs> that's what i want people to focus on so that's new for 2020. wonderful um you had mentioned the uh, grateful journal is that an app that you it is and it is um it is uh, and there's a free version of it and it is simply grateful journal has a little heart um uh, in the center of it and i love it uh you can uh, there's a free version which you can't change some of the things like it'll say uh today was a good day because and then you just fill in the blank or i'm grateful for and you fill in the blank so but the, i have the paid version which you can change any of the things i'm happy today because mom did whatever and I love the fact that you can add video and um, the photos. And so I show a lot of it in um, the Lifting the Spirit of the Caregiver um, presentation. I show some of the categories that I've um, uh, entered. And it's really cool. And I don't write in it every day, but several times a week for sure. And, you know, a lot of it involves, you know, my mom, of course, and all the things, I'm, and as I said, I'm grateful that she can do. So that's probably my favorite app at the moment is you know being able to write about and take pictures of you know what we're you know what we're grateful for and so it and now we, you can always look back at the entries that's what i love most about it that you can go back you know when the day isn't going all that great and you can look hey mom did that puzzle on christmas day my mother did a puzzle and i was stunned by it and then she talked about it my, my cousin was there christmas eve my mother didn't say a word and uh, Christmas Day, she talked the whole time I was there. And when she was pushing down the puzzle piece, <laughs> I put the video on Facebook. And she says, I'm pressing down on it. And I just burst it. <laughs> she hasn't said a whole sentence in a long time. And so that was in my grateful journal. She not only talked the, almost the whole time I was there. I was there for hours. And, uh, but she finished that puzzle. And she was so proud of She just stared at it. It was awesome. So that was my Christmas Day grateful journal entry. Oh, sweet, sweet. Well, Loretta, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time to be with us. I just, I love spending time with you. And I just, uh, I, I just honor all that you do and how you do it. Um, you're just thank absolutely you. amazing. For our audience, you can go to LorettaVenny.com, click on it once, and you will have the gift of Loretta right in, right on your screen if it's on the phone or the computer or whatever. But she really is just, just as authentic as you see her now. This is just who she is to her core, and she's just a, a joy to work with. So thank you for all you are doing uh, for Dementia Care and the wonderful example you're setting for all of us. Oh, Yay! Yeah, uh, just really really love what you're doing and appreciate uh, your openness to share. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Anything for you, Lord. And I, I certainly appreciate all the things that you do too. Where would we be without you and all of your awards and accolades and you have earned every bit of that. So, you know, we're just as proud of of you and I mean you know this is a fight that it does take everybody so I love the fact that there's so many people you know in this fight um, you know until we find the cure and we just keep going so but I'm, I'm absolutely proud to call you a friend and all that so I'm so glad we finally met in person it was just let's just say it was one of the highlights of 2019 so <laughs> that was awesome but thank you so much for having me I appreciate it well, thank you, and best of luck in 2020, and we're yes. going to hear more about your new program rolling out, too. So keep All right. Up. I'll keep you updated. All right. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.